This morning, if you would, I know you just sat down, we are going to have the opportunity to look at one of our psalms, our ongoing series of psalms, and we would ask if you would to stand in honor of the reading of God's word as our children make their way out. We will be looking this morning at Psalm 131. It's three verses long, so we'll have you guys sitting comfortably here very shortly. But we do want to give our attention even to short sections of Scripture, knowing that it is God-breathed. And so in Psalm 131, we read a psalm of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning as your church, and we ask that you would do a work in us to calm and to compose our souls before you, that we would be ready to receive your word and to conform ourselves to it. Thank you, Father, even just for the opportunity this morning to hear from our children singing the truths of which we as adults are still coming to understand and to live out, to see the faith being handed from generation to generation. And we are grateful to be counted among that chain of those who believe that goes all the way back into the earliest times of Scripture and will extend all the way into eternity. And so we ask this morning that we would be encouraged as we walk our little segment of that great race. And so we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it has definitely been a fun week around here. Busy, lots going on. Uh, thank you to all the parents, again, and volunteers involved in VBS. I've been requested, and before I forget, I'll throw it in now. For those of you parents that do have VBS kids, if you're able and willing to stay through just the first part of second service to lend your children's voices uh, for the benefit of second service as well, they would appreciate that if that's possible. But I want to turn our attention this morning to something that might be a common phrase in our culture, but is probably a very poorly or little understood concept, and that is the idea of having childlike faith. And I think we see a picture of that in our psalm this morning, and I think it's a really timely and a helpful topic given the state really of our country and for many of us, just our own lives. America's got some issues right now. I don't know if you've noticed. We're all a little stressed out. We've gone from the land of the free and the home of the brave to the land of the freaked out and the home of the dismayed. <laughs> uh, the American Psychological Association, even all the way back in 2014 when they did a fairly landmark study, noted that over 70% of all people interviewed, so they experienced both physical and psychological symptoms of stress in their lives. They described fatigue, headaches, upset stomachs and muscle tension, irritability, anger, nervousness, nervousness lack of energy. 70% of people in our country said, this is my life. <laughs> we'll get to the 70-year-olds in just a minute. I got you. Hold on. <laughs> Health care and missed work from stress just in that year alone cost American businesses $300 billion dollars. People are stressed out about their job situations, their money, their health and relationships. Poor nutrition, media overload, and sleep deprivation round out the top causes of stress in our country. But we're not just stressed, we're anxious. Anxiety is also an issue that has been steadily on the rise. Historically, the group of people who are least anxious in American culture are those over 72. 72. 
those who have had the most experience and have survived enough crises to sort of take the long view on things. And yet, last year, 56% of those over 72 said they felt our country is at the lowest point they have ever experienced and are more anxious about it now than they have been in their entire life. These are people who lived through Pearl Harbor, World War II, the Vietnam War, JFK and MLK assassinations, Gulf War, 9-11, and much more. And they said last year was the most anxiety-inducing year in their memory. And the percentage of people who agree with that only increases the younger you get in the demographic pool. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America reports that just over 18% of the population in America, or some 40 million people over the age of 18, have a level of anxiety they would diagnose as a mental illness. That's almost 20%. Almost one out of five people in America, according to this association, they would say, are so anxious about life, they would diagnose it as a mental illness. Add to that the pace of life in our country. The New York Post wrote an article entitled, Society's Self-Destructive Addiction to Faster Living. And in it, it said this, society is now dominated by beliefs, attitudes, and ways of thinking that elevate the values of impulse, instant gratification, and loss of control to first-line actions and reactions. I want it now, or do it now, are valued mantras for today's with-it person, young or old. Add to instant action the belief that there are no limits to human power, no limits to action, no limits to success. Fueled by the grandiosity and omnipotence of these beliefs, people get high on the emotions of endless possibility with no need to ever stop or slow down. So how are we doing this morning? Are you caught up in the stressed out, anxious, hyperactive rush? Hobbies, media consumption, errands, vacations, work, pets, the gym, shopping, yard work, taxiing children to sports and camps, planning, reading, church activities, and on and on. And then throw into that mix a good dose of life, sickness, injury, car problems, plumbing leaks, and you have the recipe for a whirlwind. America has a problem. And many of us are showing the symptoms of that problem. We are anxious, we are worried, we're stressed, we're exhausted, we're driven, but we're discouraged, desperate, and as a result, we're often sick and miserable. In the mix of all this, sometimes I think we just want a Peter Pan moment. A chance to return to a simpler frame of mind. And even our culture talks longingly of seeing the world through the eyes of a child. Childlike love, childlike trust, childlike faith. There's this sense that we've lost something along the way of growing up and that we want to go back and recapture it. And our psalm this morning is the antidote to the frenetic lifestyle that our country is accustomed to and that so many of us are accustomed to. And it may not even be involve becoming less busy. But it will involve recapturing an attitude that children sometimes instinctively grasp, but that we as adults will need to grow to achieve. And so that brings us to Psalm 131 this morning. And in contrast to Psalm 119 that we looked at a few weeks ago, the longest psalm in the Bible, this is one of the shortest psalms in the Bible, but I think it packs no less of a punch it just fits it all into a very small space. Psalm 131 is a, a psalm in a group of very special psalms that begin with Psalm 120 and run through Psalm 140, 34, excuse me. And notice in your Bible that this psalm, like the ones around it, begins with the phrase, a song of ascents. These 15 psalms from 120 through 134, these 15 psalms were sung by the Israelites as they ascended up to the hill of Jerusalem when they would gather several times a year as a people. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 called all of Israel to gather for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. 
We're right in between the last two on our calendar. Uh, if we were in Israel and the temple was still there, we'd be getting ready for a journey in September up to the temple for that last feast. And as we would go, we would likely in that caravan be singing to each other these psalms, preparing our hearts to enter into the city of God and his temple. And there are some who've actually pointed out the significance that between the court of the Israelites and the court of women in the temple, there's a staircase consisting of the same number of steps as there are psalms of ascent. And some theorize that when you actually finally made it to your destination, you would stand on that first step and sing the first psalm, and then you would go to the next step and sing the second psalm, and you would usher yourself with singing into the temple. That staircase you can still find today. I know some years ago when I had a chance to study in Israel as a student, our whole class, we did, did that together. Now, they didn't trust us singing, so we read from the Psalms, but it didn't want to disturb the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, but it was a real special experience to, to get a sense of that anticipation of singing all these truths as you're about to go into the place in the Old Testament where you would encounter in a special way the presence of God. Four of the Psalms are written by David, one is by Solomon, the rest are anonymous. But together they prepared the hearts of God's people to worship him. And so as we look at Psalm 131, what are these three short verses written for Jewish pilgrims heading up to a temple in Jerusalem for a feast day, written by the ancient King David? What do they have to say to us in America in the crazy 21st century lifestyle that we are living in? I think the answer is quite a lot. And I hope by the time we're done this morning, you'll agree at least at some level with the commentator Croft who said of Psalm 30, 131 that it is one of the most beautiful psalms in the Psalter. So let's dive in and see in verse 1 the first of three principles simple principles that combat stress, anxiety, and the disquiet of our souls. These are three marks of a man or of a woman who has achieved a biblical state of childlike faith. And that first mark is that he or she is humble. He or she is humble. Look with me at verse 1. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. We see right off the bat that this psalm is a personal cry to Yahweh, to Yahweh, O Lord. And that is significant in the various uh, psalms of a sense. You will actually see this word Yahweh, this title for God, used 48 times. Because these are the words of God's people calling out to their covenant God. And so just like in the other Psalms of Ascent, we see here it opens with this description of God as the one who personally cares about me, the one who has a relationship with me based on his promises. I'm coming to somebody with whom I have to do and that I have a close connection to. It's a beautiful way to begin, and it is not introducing just a theological treatise, but it's introducing a personal statement from the heart of David himself. This is a very personal psalm. If you look at it, imagine you were writing a psalm that was going to be sung by the whole congregation of Israel. These are personal thoughts. David's not just saying, hey, let me tell you about the attributes of God, O oh people. He's saying, I'm unburdening my heart before Yahweh, and I'm inviting you to come and to see. And so we have this very personal, personal psalm. David's speaking very honestly of his own heart, and in this first verse, he's making two points. David is telling God that he is coming to worship him after having governed his life with two very important principles. First, that he has avoided pride, and second, that he has avoided presumption. He has steered clear of pride and presumption. David's life was one of a king. This was a powerful man, and he was a warrior king. Right? There are some kings you might snicker about them behind their back, 
But David wasn't that kind of a guy. He was a buff dude and in charge. And yet, David's life was marked with humility. Not something that may have come easily to him in his early years. In fact, early on when he went to visit his brothers as they were lined up and fighting the Philistines and Goliath was taunting the people of God, as you'll recall, when David showed up, he's asking around, hey, why aren't you, who's going to go fight this guy, right? And his brother says, hey, David, I know the pride in your heart. I know the pride in your heart. You're just here because you want to watch a battle. And so whether that was true or not, David had at least been under the cloud of suspicion of pride from a young age, although I think all older brothers figured their younger brothers are just being proud when they say something they're not courageous enough to say. So there may have been some of that going on. But David was going to learn and exhibit humility throughout his life. He was raised as a shepherd, And he never forgot that humble upbringing. God told him he was going to be king. And then he spent a decade running around in the wilderness, unable to actually realize what had been promised to him. And as you'll recall, multiple times he had the opportunity to take matters into his own hand and force the issue. And he chose not to, but to wait until God elevated him. He held civil war, First with Saul's son Ishbosheth, later with his own son Absalom. He was even cursed by a man named Shimei as he fled Jerusalem, running from his own son. And you don't see David flying into a murderous rage. How dare you? Do you know who I am? He never seems to have lost the grasp on, I am just a man. I'm just a man. Now, did he make some serious mistakes? Yes. And there were times when pride did lead him into sin. But if you stand back and look at the life of David and look at what characterized him in the main, he was a humble man. And that is not an easy thing to accomplish. And it is something that we as well need to strive towards. To be proud here is the idea of lifting yourself up. Human beings in the human heart, we are elevators. There's a part of our nature that is just designed to be an elevator. We find something and we take it up to the top floor. We hold it up. God is meant to be... In the elevator of our heart, we are designed to elevate and magnify him. But oh, how easily do we hit top floor and then jump in the elevator ourselves. And the life of humility is a life that says, I'm going to stay grounded. I'm going to let the one who lives in heaven be elevated. And I am content to remain here. And so David says, my heart, and then, as you always see connected in life, your eyes are both staying away from pride and from haughtiness, because what your heart desires, your eyes chase after. And so David says, my heart is not proud, and my eyes are not haughty. I'm not looking down on people in disdain. I'm not looking for opportunities to make a name for myself. I'm humble. We have to accept our finiteness as human beings. But that second part is perhaps a little bit more baffling, about not involving ourselves in great matters or in things too difficult for me. If there's anything that sounds un-American, right, that's it. This is America. We put people on the moon. We reach for the stars. There is no such thing as something too difficult for me if I work hard and put my mind to it. How's that working out for all y'all? We need to accept not only our finiteness, but that there are things which exceed that. There is that which is infinite, which goes beyond us. And there's so many different things that we could talk about. Uh, It could be something as simple as one commentator noted, 
How often do we refuse to do the things that are given to us that we know are in our grasp because we're waiting for the opportunity to do something that sounds impossible because we'll get more credit for it? And so one way to apply this concept is simply to say, just be faithful with what God has given you. Yeah, but it's, but it's easy. Well, that's kind of nice. But I also think likely in David's mind is the language of Job. The book of Job, perhaps the first written book in the Bible, even though the Pentateuch describes events before the time of Job, but, but one of the oldest books in our Bible is the book of Job, something that David would likely have been familiar with. And as you'll recall, Job enters into this wrestling match with God. Circumstances have happened in Job's life, and Job says, this is category breaking for me. This is paradigm breaking for me. I know how God works. If you do A, then God does B, and what just happened doesn't make sense. Therefore, I need to sue God for breaking up the way the universe is supposed to work. That's essentially the message of Job, the heart of Job. And then God comes and tells Job, you're getting really big for your britches. You are starting to meddle in things you don't understand. And in Job 42, Job answers the Lord, In Job 42, 1 through 6, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel with knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. One of the first places and the most important place where we need to stop and say there are things too wonderful for me is in dealing with the infiniteness of our God. His ways are unsearchable, and here's the hard part. His ways affect your life. And there are things that are going to happen in my life and in your life that are unsearchable. Do you think that contributes to stress and anxiety in our world? You bet. How much of our anxiety is based on not understanding why things are happening to me? And David has said, I've come to the point where I've realized there are things that are just outside my ability to understand. And I'm okay with that. This is not anti-intellectualism. This is not irrationality. This is not throwing caution to the wind. David was going to give birth to the smartest dude who ever lived on the planet. But what this was is a heart that says, I know what it means to be a man. It is not to be God, therefore I will not be proud, and it is not to know everything, therefore I will be able to admit when something has gone beyond my depth and I'm not going to involve myself and I'm not going to stir up my soul trying to make sense of it all. A quick aside as we get ready to look at our second point is this. When we look at a verse like this, it may be tempting to ask, but in writing verse 1, doesn't David undo it? Right To say, I am humble. Does that not then mean, no, you are not? <laughs> and I think there's maybe been a little bit of a misnomer around the virtue of humility. Is it really true that humility is the only virtue you are unable to be aware of whether or not you are obeying? We ought to be able to honestly say, Am I humbled or not? Now, it is one of the greatest sins for a man to claim humility in pride. And in the church, especially if you grow up in the church, you kind of perfect how to do that. 
But it is not wrong to be able to say, I am humbled before my God. And, and as a church, we should not fear humility like it's some sort of a, a mysterious object that you can only catch in the peripheral of your vision, but if you stare at it, it vanishes. We should be able to stare at what God has said about us and about himself and see ourselves so clearly in that light that we know when we have arrived at the point when we are put in our place and can say, I am not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I'm staying away from stuff that's too marvelous for me. I'm ready to listen to my God. And that is the point where David humbly and honestly and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit has arrived in Psalm 131. And doing this in our own hearts enables us to bring our soul to a very special place. Quiet. Quiet. The second characteristic of childlike faith or of toddler trust, and I'll explain why toddler in just a moment in this verse, is that we are hushed. We are hushed. Psalm 131, verse 2, Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. This word surely isn't actually there in the Hebrew, but it's an attempt on the part of the translators to get across the idea that the Hebrew of verse 2 is structured like an Old Testament oath. It's like a declaration of something that you are promising is true. And so I think it's appropriate to put that word in there. This is the case. What's the case? What has he done? He has composed and quieted his very soul. From his humility, he has now been put into a place where he can compose and quiet his soul. That word compose there isn't so much like we would think in terms of music, where we're composing music, but it, it's a word that means to even out and to level off. You can see this word even used in the book of Isaiah to talk about preparing a garden for planting, where I, I've tilled things up, I've pulled out the rocks, I've smoothed out the high places, I've filled in the low places, everything is now flat and ready to be receptive for seed. And, and David here says, my soul has been leveled. It's been smoothed off. All the jaggedy up and down bits have now come into a position of peace. And quieted. That word quieted means exactly what it looks like. To be silent. David was not a hermit. Right? David knew what it meant like to have too much time on his hands. Right? Growing up as a shepherd, <whistles> sheep, come back. That's the most exciting thing that's happened in the last hour. <laughs> right? David knew what that was like. David's now king, a warring king. He has affairs of state, and he has affairs of the, the local civic uh, duties that he has to hearing people's complaints. He's planning wars. He's keeping back the enemies, economics. I mean, he's got stuff going on all the time. He's one of those people that has people running after him with notepads. Sir, your, your 11 o'clock just canceled. I think we can swing in. The... That's David's life, right? This is not a slow-moving man. I think that's helpful to remember because we read some of these psalms and we think, yeah, that's great, but that's written by somebody in their cabin, on the lake, who doesn't have a real job, right? This isn't like Walden's Pond, where it's we just check out of life for a while and talk about how wonderful it is to be all at peace because we're not actually engaged in the responsibilities of life. This is a man who's very, very busy and he says, in the midst of my busyness, my soul is flat. My heart is quiet. This is quite the trick. This is something that we need to learn. This is not an, an easy thing for Americans to come to because in our busyness we attach so much of our worth and our value and our dreams and our hopes 
and our ambitions. And so when busyness is not producing what we want, we become stressed out and anxious. And David says, I've actually settled all of those things. All of my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions. I'm just a man. I'm not trying to be more than that. Life throws things at me that I can't understand. I'm okay with that. God is my Yahweh, my covenant-keeping God, who is going to take care of me. My hope is in that. And boy, do I have a long schedule today. But I am composed and quiet as I get ready to go into it. And so he comes up with this beautiful picture to give us of what this looks like and feels like for him. And it is the picture of a weaned child. You see that there? Like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. So what does this mean to be a weaned child? Well, today we tend to wean our children fairly quickly. But in the biblical period, the norm was to carry your child and to nurse until almost the age of three. Now, there are those today that are very excited about that. I remember we had at least one lactation expert that was encouraging us to, to nurse until five. It's like, I kind of have a rule. If you can ask for it, you can't have it. <laughs> but <laughs> the idea of weaning in our culture is a very short period tied to infancy. But in, in the Israelite culture, it was more until they were toddlers and that's when you would wean them. And it was not always an easy process because at that point, they're self-aware enough to know what they want and how they've usually received it and to be pretty, pretty insistent about it. And so it was a difficult process of weaning your child and teaching them, no, your life is different now. But when that process had happened, the child had a very different disposition Whereas before, the child was characterized by a desperation to get its needs, wants in the way, or its needs met in the way that it was accustomed to, the child had now learned that food will be provided, your needs will be met, and you can relax. These children were usually still carried by the mother in a little wrapping, especially when they're very young like that, as the mother went about her duties. But instead of always saying, I want milk, I want milk, now you had the wean child that was just resting, relaxed. I'm okay. I'll be taken care of. And David says, like, like that wean child who's just hanging on his mom, wrapped close and safe, not desperate, not demanding, content, knowing that where he used to get all of his sustenance from is no more, but that that's okay. That's what my soul is like inside of me. When your soul nestles up against your heart, is it like a weaned child that just says, yeah, good to go? Or do you find that battle where your soul says, this isn't right, I'm not content, I need more, this isn't working, God has taken this from me, or God won't give this to me, and you find this constant source of conflict and desperation going on between your heart and your soul. We as adults need to go through the same process that infants need to do going into their young toddler years, and that is to be weaned of what we so desperately demand for our own happiness until all that remains is a contentment in the provision of God in his timing and in his way. And he may put something on the plate you've never seen before and it smells funny, but it's going to be fine. <laughs> There's a weaning that takes place at salvation when we are weaned from our enslavement to sin and to the world, but there is a continual weaning process that we call sanctification in which we are being set apart further and further from the world and from all those things in it that our hearts are still accustomed to desiring. And we must go through that process. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14 
The author there writing to the people says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And so we see here that weaning is not just moving us away from that which we feel like we demand and we need, but it's also moving moving away from that which is too simplistic to sustain mature life. And it's moving to the place where we are sustained and contented by solid food that is able to help us grow into real maturity. This is not a place, childlike faith is not a place of spiritually regressing back to infancy A heart that trusts God with a toddler-like faith is one which has worked very hard to grow to maturity in Christ. And so we are like a swift ship cutting across a smooth sea rather than a stationary ship battered and sinking in a storm. The composure and quietness of our soul enables mature living, not escaping from reality. And yet too often, all of our life about us and all of our heart within us is full of chaos and turmoil while we ourselves seem to be getting nowhere. So which ship is most like your soul this morning? Is your soul a contented toddler resting within you or a screaming baby demanding satisfaction of its desires? Because David was able to master his own soul, he was also able to speak to the nation around him with great conviction in verse 3, where we see the third mark of toddler trust. You are humble, you're hushed, and you're hopeful. And in verse 3, David turns to the people of God and says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. From this time forth and forever. Now there's a little bit... uh, a little tiny note here in the verse one where it begins with, O oh Lord, that's actually what appears first in the Hebrew, Yahweh. But it's not the same pattern in verse three. In verse three, it doesn't begin by saying, Israel. It begins by saying, hope, O oh Israel. And so it's like David just almost can't contain himself. I'm humble before God. I'm not involving myself in things that are too difficult for me. I've composed and quieted my soul. I'm like a weaned child within me. And so hope, hope. Everybody, oh Israel, hope. Do it now and do it forever. That word hope can also be translated as linger. To linger. Right when we see somebody who has just sort of quit and given up, we often say they lost hope. They've lost the ability to linger in their condition. They've lost a reason to stay where they're at. And David says, yeah, life throws stuff at you you can't understand. So just linger and wait. Wait. Because Yahweh is still involved. How long do I need to wait? Well, now and forever. When when can I start screaming for milk again? Don't. When can I say, mommy, 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 (laughs) mommy? Don't. Hope. In Yahweh, hope now, hope forever. And so see the rhythm of the Jewish life coming up to the temple these multiple times a year. And every time as you come, you're reminded, be humble, be quiet, and hope. When? Right now and forever. A few months later, hope now and forever. A few months later, hope now and forever. And this became the cycle of of encouragement for the nation of Israel. And I want to challenge us, let's incorporate that into our cycle of worship as well. When we come and gather corporately as a church to worship God, let us remember, we must come humbly. We must come with a quieted spirit. 
And let us hope now and forever. Next week, next Sunday, let's hope now and forever. Next week, next Sunday, let's hope now and forever. My circumstances haven't changed. Next week, let's hope now and forever. And so Sundays will become the footprints of our conviction of faith as we stride week to week through life from here until our eternal rest. That is the pattern that God wishes us to follow and is laid out here in this psalm. I want to take just a few brief minutes now before we sing our closing song. If you're like me, there's a lot of stuff on your back burner right now and your front burner and a few things that need to go on a burner you don't have room on the oven for. And would you just take a few minutes in physical quietness to just talk to your Lord and say, Lord, would you help me to compose and quiet my own soul? And let's leave this building this morning refreshed, humble, hushed, and hopeful. I'll close this in a moment, in a, moment, in a word of prayer, and then we'll sing our closing song.